I looked up in the sky and I thought, one day I'll be a soldier, then I'll be a missionary. Why a soldier? I always wanted to be a soldier. It was something that I believe was inside me. The sound of the guns, I always ran to them. It's what I was made to do. Don't be afraid to suffer. Don't think that being Christians means you're not gonna suffer. What are we doing with kids in a conflict zone? Is this the right thing for them? We're in this completely together. They help this work be more loving. They help this work penetrate deeper. What do we have to offer? Peace may come. How do you arm a kid for peace, actually? And this war has not stopped. Over a million people are internally displaced and many more millions have fled. Connected to freedom is justice. But the only way you're gonna get true freedom and justice is with love. We don't want to be against the government, but when a government oppresses its own people, we have to stand against it, not because we're better, because that's just wrong. I want to be free. We all want to be free. Every human wants to be free. Why am I not afraid? Because I love these people. When you really love someone, fear is no longer a big priority. You're with us. You know, it means God hasn't forgotten us. The world can know. We count. I came to the edge of the tank, and I said, this is what I'm going to do. You guys give me cover, I'm going to run. And I thought, there's no way I'm going to live through this. It wasn't fatalistic, it was just kind of logical. You're not going to make it on this one. But damn, that kid's still there. I got to do something. And I just felt it's now or never. is a person who puts him or herself at risk for the benefit of others. They are the kind of people who stand in harm's way and do not wither in the heat of battle. It has been my great blessing to have spent most of my life in the company of heroes. Each of us have unique God-given gifts. How we use them is up to us. We can practice them and hone them into something very powerful, achieving amazing deeds or what may be one of life's greatest tragedies, we can squander the opportunity and allow our gifts to atrophy and wither. We lived out in the country, in what's now a developed area of Thailand, near Kanchanabri, not far from the bridge of the River Kwai. And it was a great life. I grew up riding horses, I had my, my 22 boys rifle, a little single shot thing. Sure. And I joined the NRA in 1967. We thought every American was in the NRA because we learned how to shoot, how to treat weapons safely, you know, got scolded a million times if the barrel went the wrong way. I remember I was behind my parents' house, which is out in a rural area. I looked up in the sky and I thought, one day I'll be a soldier, then I'll be a missionary. I don't know what, I was five years old. And you know, my, my dad was my hero. He was a soldier, fought in the Korean War. And then he said, sometimes you have to go fight with a weapon. But after the Korean War, I decided if I ever went back, it's gonna be with a Bible and that war can solve some temporary problems that are necessary to solve, but it never solves eternal problems. Until we can learn to love each other, you'll never solve the ultimate problem. So later I thought, was that just honoring my dad and trying to be like him, maybe? But I thought it was something deeper. It's like, you're gonna be a soldier than a missionary. Why a soldier? Maybe like you. Uh, I love the action. I always wanted to be a soldier. The sound of the guns, I always ran to them. It was something that I believe was inside me. It's what I was made to do. And I decided I'm gonna be a Marine, because they're the best. And they're the toughest, meanest, and definitely have the coolest uniform. So when I applied for scholarships, I applied for a Navy artist, sure. stuff, which is how I'd be a Marine, and Army, and I got both. But at the final decision, why did I choose Army over yeah. Marine Corps, was I wanted to be in Special Forces, ultimately. Sua Sponte, the, the Rangers slogan. De oppresso liber, the Special Forces. So they were burned into your heart. Yes, sua sponte means of their own accord. That means even if you're the only guy there, 
go do it until right. you're dead. Of their own accord, it means the battalion commander may not be there anymore. You may be the acting battalion commander. Go. And then the oppressor Liber, free the oppressed, is from Isaiah. And then Jesus quotes it again in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. I came here to free the oppressed. I've always loved that because I want to be free. We all want to be free. Every human wants to be free. And so that was burned inside me. So I, I loved all of my experience in the army. I didn't love every part of it, the bureaucracy and the zillion rules, but I love the action, I love the people I was with. What role did Karen play in your transition from being a soldier to being a soldier for Christ? A huge role. But before I met her, I was already deciding to leave the army. When I first met Karen at church, after church, she, she said, well, what do you do? I said, I'm in the Army, Special Forces. She goes, what's that? <laughs> Tell me how impressed you were the fact that Dave was a Special Forces officer, Green Beret, paratrooper, ranger. Pretty impressive, huh? I didn't know anything. It was terrible. My, uh, I hadn't met anybody in the Army before. I just had missed the Gulf War. I was in first Special Forces group, and the, Gulf, the first Gulf War ended too quickly for us to be part of. I was in Asia. And she goes, were you in the Gulf War? I said, no, I was too scared. She goes, well, that's okay. <laughs> I said, no, man, we were dying. It's like not getting to the playoffs, you know? I can't remember at which point he burst out laughing and just realized <laughs> I got to set this girl straight. So I asked her out right away. And she's like, no, military people, this, this. She's like, but I was persistent. And finally she w was willing to go climbing with me. And we climbed Mount Shuxon in Washington State. Near the it's a technical climb. And I thought, well, she'll make it to base camp, and that's good enough. She's never climbed. We'll go up the steepest part. I, I guided for the Rangers in SF climbing. So you get that feeling when you know people are about getting a little bit scared or you need to say something. So I'm at the, one of the harder parts, and I got my ice axe up here, and I'm looking down at her. How are you doing? I'm trying to calm her. She says this big, natural smile. I'm digging it. I said, who says that? Your first climb, man, I'm scared. So we get to the top, come down. I said, Lord, help me. let me marry her. I'll do anything. Was it really? an iffy thing for you about whether this was the right guy? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. I felt I connected with him on a spiritual level in an amazing way. He was the strongest man of God I'd ever known. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to keep up. I wasn't sure if I would be able to do what he was going to do, and I didn't exactly even know what that was. While Dave Eubank was trying to convince Karen to marry him, he received a phone call from Thailand. It was his dad, who was meeting with a foreign minister of the Wa tribe of Burma. The minister had seen a photo of Dave in his uniform, and he asked Dave to come to Thailand to train his people. When your dad called you to come to Burma, she was with you. I'd already asked her to marry me once that day. And listen, she said, Dave, we're not even dating. No, very nicely, but you know, no. He said, well, I'm going to Burma. I wish you'd come with me, but I understand you don't have to go. God's got to lead you. I love you, bye. And she goes, well, aren't you going to take me down to California to see my parents on spring break? We're leaving tomorrow. I said, you still want to go with me? Oh, yeah. So we drive down to California, and we're sitting on the sands, and the moon comes up, and it's full, and it's got a ring around it, and it's just bright as anything. She's saying, well, Dave, I don't want you to go to Burma without me. I don't want this. I don't want that. I don't want this. I don't want that. And I said, I know what you don't want. What do you want? Do you want to marry me? It's the fourth time. She goes, okay. Just like, <laughs> like it was a used car deal, you know? <laughs> Except I was a used car. But I knew it was real. So the next morning we went to Lover's Point, right there at, at, at Carmel, and I said, you don't have to do this, because I don't know what happened last night. You said that, but you know, she says, no, I'm in. I'm in it. So we got married in Malibu on the beach, and then went to Burma together. And then the two of us on our first mission trip, which was our honeymoon, we only had each other to talk to. There was nobody else that spoke English, really. I had no concept of missions. I was gonna be a special ed teacher. What am I gonna do there? And he said, people just wanna see if you live your life any differently as a Christian. Do you treat your family differently? Do you treat your kids differently? Do you, how do you handle issues? So I thought, okay, well, I could try that. I could just try to live as a Christian, but uh, I still didn't know, of course, the big picture. Burma doesn't even show up on a map anymore. So the folks that are watching us, Talk to him about the Burma you know. Burma, which is now called Myanmar by some countries and some people, it's, it was an old kingdom. But before the kingdom of Burmans were there, there were other ethnic minorities. The Mon, the Kachin, the Shan were there first. Later on, the Burman people came from 
what's now India and Tibet, that area, and came down, and they were more populist, more organized, and more aggressive, and the Burman kings started to take over. There was constant battle and enslavement between the Burmans and the ethnic minorities. The British came and bumped into the Burmans. The Burmese thought there was no greater empire than them. They picked the fight with the British and lost. Burma became a colony of England after India was. World War II comes around, the Japanese invade, and the Burmans joined the Japanese, but the ethnics joined the allies. The Kachin Rangers, the Karen resistance, all these fought on our side against the Japanese. There was a tacit understanding, when the Japanese are defeated, you will have some kind of autonomy or rights within Burma. But when World War II was over, people just walked away from it. So very quickly, in 1949, the Burman military, which is pretty much becoming a dictatorship, began to attack the ethnic people saying, hey, you all belong to us. There was a bloody massacre on Christmas Eve on 1948, 1949 against the Karen, and that precipitated what's now the longest running war in the world right now, 69 years of fighting in Burma to now. The Burma army is one of the world's worst perpetrators of human rights abuses right now. The Burma army will go into an area, attack it, burn a village, and then lay landmines all around so that even if you come back, you get blown up trying to come back to your fields. I've talked to many rape victims. I found people murdered, kids murdered, villages burned. We've been shot at many times as we try to give assistance. Nothing's been really done to stop them. In Europe, when that kind of thing was happening in former Yugoslavia, it was called ethnic cleansing. Right. You don't hear that term being used. Oh, it's definitely it ethnic cleansing. You know, I wouldn't call it genocide because they don't really want to kill everybody, all the ethnics. They want to dominate and use them. Right. They want to be in complete control. And the Burma army, you know, we pray for them. We don't want to be against them. We don't want to be against the government. We want to be for people. But when a government oppresses its own people, we have to stand against it. Not because we're better, because that's just wrong. And this war has not stopped. Over a million people are internally displaced and many more millions have fled to India, Bangladesh, Thailand, some even to China. In 1993, my wife, Karen and I, we just got married in Malibu and we were invited to go up to help the Wa people of Burma. And as we moved along the border, we ran into major offenses the Burma army were conducting against the ethnic people, specifically the Kren, the Kreni, and the Shan. And I remember people fleeing and I thought, I gotta do something and prayed, God, what can I do? And I thought, well, I can help one person. I'll be glad, they'll be glad. Maybe that's all I can do. We started helping people. And after a few months of doing this, other ethnic people started to join us. And pretty soon we had five to 20 people, depending on the mission, men and women who were part of our team going into areas under attack to help people in Burma. That was the beginning of FBR. After a couple of years, the ethnic resistance leadership said, oh, we like you guys, can you make more? So slowly we grew, till now we have 70 to 80, depends on the year, relief teams active. These are five person teams in all the major conflict areas of Burma. I was a ranger and special forces officer. And those units attract highly motivated, dedicated, tough people, and not difficult to train. Going into Burma with ethnic people, many of whom didn't even have a second grade education, but they're also highly motivated also dedicated, tough as nails, and actually know more about the jungle than I do. They can do anything. And so training them has really been a matter of taking some skills that they hadn't been familiar with, whether it's advanced medicine, um, navigation with compasses, or using a GPS or reporting or videography, and giving them those skills to help integrate into the skills they already had to better help people and get the news out. The different ethnic groups, they're very similar as the Native Americans here. They had their own areas. They had no concept of a country, of a government larger than their tribe. And so when the Burma army began to attack and control, there never has been much of a real united front because it's not really in their culture or their history to do that. It's very difficult to unite people who have always been separated. That's been something that we have not been able to do on a large level, but only on a small level in our camp. That's but the only real unity I know is among the teams working together. They learn to love each other and care about each other. And so on a very small scale, we have unity among our teams. And other people in Burma have found that too. When you come to a common purpose, you're gonna work on a clinic, you're gonna do this with these different tribes. We need each other and some people are better at this, some people are better at that, and together you have more. How many will you graduate each year? 80 to 100 a year. And how long will they stay with the Rangers? We'd like them to stay four years, mm -hmm. but 
we don't control that. And they go on to being a school teacher or go in the army or be a pastor or go back to their farm. It's like a volunteer fire department. The Freedom Rangers, our job is to give help, hope, and love and get the news out. Our job is not to attack anyone. At the same time, we're not pacifists. It's up to each individual ranger to decide how they're gonna respond when the enemy comes. Anybody can join the Freedom Rangers as long as you subscribe to three things, or you can read and write, that's one. Do this for love, the teams aren't paid. And number three, you can't run if people can't run. So you gotta be the last person out. If you're willing to do that, it doesn't matter what your religion is. As I began to work with the Kren and other tribes, but particularly the Kren at first, they really loved us and loved me. And we're so grateful I was there, even when I ran out of things to give them. Hey, you're, you're with us. You know, it means God hasn't forgotten us. The world can know. We count. As Dave and I began having a family, we did decide, what are we doing with kids in a conflict zone? Yeah. Is this the right thing for them? And for him, it was just natural, but I really had to make sure I knew why I was doing that. And I think it was hardest at night when I would go to bed wondering what is gonna happen and Wishing I could just wrap my kids kind of in bubble wrap. I said, Lord, could I just insulate them from all of this? And I felt him speak back and say, yes, and you could effectively insulate them from me too. You know this is the right place to be. You came here with all the right reasons. Now that things could be out of control, it's my time to talk to them. We live in the jungle, so we have no plumbing, no Wi-Fi. We have waterfalls, horses. We eat snakes for breakfast and ride our horses everywhere. Well, we've always looked at our family as the Incredibles family. That was our favorite movie growing up. While FBR trained people, Karen was moved to create a program for the mothers and children in the many displaced communities throughout Burma. She called it the Good Life Club and designed it to teach God's word and restore as much peace and love to a place where violence had become the new normal. We're focused on what? is our purpose here, to love kids in the war zone. And so when it's time to do a kids program, we go and definitely the hardest thing in the world is to not know the outcome. What else are you supposed to do? You're never guaranteed another day. You're not guaranteed another breath. God gives you enough breath as he wants you to have. He makes your heart pump for as long as he wants you to do it. And what else are you supposed to pursue but the eternal things? And so when God's put a vision in front of you, I couldn't live with myself or look God in the eye if I didn't say, I believe we're supposed to walk this way. Yes, let's go do this kids program in a place that's sort of potentially under attack. And there was a place that got attacked. Yeah. And yet the more we were there with those kids and you could hear the gunfire and the mortars coming closer, it was like, yes, we are here with these kids because we're not doing it by ourselves. We're there because these families are under attack. It makes you more and more connected to that vision of, yes, this is why we're here, because those kids are under the same and even greater risk than we are. They live it. If we get out, we get out, but they're still there. You sometimes feel afraid. Sometimes. Yes, but we choose to love, choose to understand that God loves us and he has a plan for us and that we're helping people. And in the end, that's what matters. We're in this completely together. And they help this work be more loving. They help this work penetrate deeper. They help us to connect our family that's American with a family that's Iraqi, with Syria, with Burmese, with Sudanese. All these things we do together that are of love are eternal. And when we're in Sudan, for example, where the Sudanese government's attacking the Nubans and we're there, and my daughter, who was Suzanne, maybe nine, 10 then, she goes, Daddy, we're not just a family, we're a team. Uh, wow, and then the, the Nubans said, you came with your family, you don't want anything from us. That means you, you think we're the same. You brought your most precious thing, we give you our most precious thing, our country. And we're like this. They're where other families are. Where families are, we can be, they can be. What led you to Sudan? Well, a friend of mine knew about our work in Burma, and he said, there's a war going on in Sudan. In Darfur, and there was a ceasefire going on and off, but in Nuba Mountains, where there's Christians, Muslims, and animists together being attacked daily by the Sudanese armed forces. Can you go and help? You see what you can do. I'll get you in there. Don't open the bomb bay door now, please. Get the ground. On. Get on. That was so fun. Saf just attacked us, the um, Sudan army. That's pieces of the bomb that exploded. In the beginning, we didn't get along that good. With the Nubans because they were far superior to us and they didn't, weren't interested in anything we're trying to teach them. We're trying to develop relief teams like we do in Burma. 
And then we weren't impressed with them either. A bunch of lazy dudes, man, make the women do all the work. And who are these guys, you know? And one day we just realized, who sent us here? Jesus. So why are we irritated with these guys? We're here to follow Jesus and serve them. So we asked God to forgive us. Then we went to the Nubans that were training and said, okay, we're gonna stop everything. You tell us what you want. Forget the Freedom Ranger way. We did it for 20 years, it works for us, but we're here to serve you. So we did only what they asked us for. And we became, began to love each other and respect each other. That's how we got involved in Sudan. We've only been there twice. Now there's a ceasefire in the Nubian mountains. And kind of concurrently with that ceasefire is ISIS starts its thing. 2014 in the Middle East, and then we get invited there. The Middle East missions were the culmination of 20 years of experience, of learning, of technique uh, for myself and for my teams. We brought our senior medics from Burma who'd been operating in jungle combat medicine for over 20 years. Every kind of sickness and gunshot and wound and landmines, they were used to it without hospitals, without ERs. They had to do it themselves. ISIS just ran an IED in the civilians and the Iraqi army and we'll be helping to treat them and pray healing for them on the southeast side of Mosul right now. In Iraq, we get trucks, we get supplies. One day we gave water to 7,000 people as they fled. Everybody got it. And we got at least got snacks for 7,000 people. These are people fleeing ISIS. Each box here has meals for 10 people or one family. If it's a big family, we give them two boxes. So they get at least one a day. That's survival rations. We've got enough here for about 500 people. We've got almost 500 people out there now. And personally, I thank God for these people that give us this stuff. Some of the organizations working with the Free Burma Rangers in Mosul were Charity Samaritan's Purse, Christian Aid, and Partners Relief and Development. They had supplies, and David's team had the ability to get those provisions to the front lines, deep into ISIS-held territory, where they were the most needed, but where relief organizations simply couldn't go. And in the Battle of Mosul, they had supplies that they couldn't get to all the places. And they had some assistance they could get to the front line, but they didn't have the assets to get to the front line. So they gave us food, water, blankets, and shoes, and diapers, and basically anything that was needed. And so they put in our hands the things that we didn't have. And that was a great team effort. We're feeding people. ISIS attacked us. The Iraqi army counterattack. And there's still ISIS somewhere out there. Just the Battle of Mosul alone, we fed 75,000 people. ISIS is still there, but push back a little, and we'll keep, we didn't lose anybody, we'll keep feeding people. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Please keep protecting us and all these people. I'm in. You know, Mosul, we faced ISIS many times, and sometimes we did fight back ISIS, you know, sitting there in the street, we're doing medical care, and all of a sudden, here comes ISIS, comes around the corner, seven yards away, another five yards away, they're opening up, and it's bomb, 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 they shoot my friend six times, they shoot me once, I fought back, I prayed, God help me, and I fought back. In the Battle of Mosul, we were involved in seven different rescues. Many were inside ISIS territory. We're here to rescue this little girl. We're in ISIS territory, surrounded by them. Lord Jesus, help us, help us get her out. With God's help in the Rocky Army, our department, we rescued her. Now we gotta get out of here, so thank you, Lord, face one. She's Rahab. 17 years old, buried nice. three days during the fighting with ISIS. And we thank God for her life. And I'm going to be your friend forever. Bless the moves. That's where ISIS started. And we're pushing back. We're going to go provide spiritual, in Jesus' name, support and medical support right behind the assault. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, L
there's a great wellspring of good hearts in America. You know, many people when I was in the Middle East said, why do you come help us? We wouldn't help you. What are you doing helping us? In the midst of our sins as Americans, we have many, we're humans like everybody else. There's a great wellspring of love in our country. There's a great wellspring to try to do good. We came here because we hear about your problem and we want to tell you we love you. When the situation is the worst you can imagine with people at their worst, faith gets clearer. And I feel vigilant to preserve the love, the faith, the hope that we've come to give. I told Karen, we're getting deeper into this thing. I guess God wants us here. So I'm not sure where it goes, but we want to keep developing these relationships as God wants us to. We're putting in playgrounds now where there have been battles. We put playground in Raqqa, which is the capital of ISIS in Syria, two in Tabqa, in Deir Zor, which is the conflict area right now. I think we're going to keep doing that until they don't want us to do it. And anything else we can do to help. One thing about Iraq and our work in Iraq and Syria, we could not have done that work without the foundation of 20 years in Burma to be spiritually, emotionally, mentally mature enough to go to the Middle East and fit in. I mean, that, I, I am so grateful for the Iraqis who accepted us and the Kurds said they don't have to accept us. They accepted us. This is a lot about them. But all the things that we learned in Burma about dealing with people, about trusting in God, about medical techniques, being under fire, all that was sharpened and brought to a point in the Middle East, especially in the Battle of Mosul. If you look at all of those kinds of adventures, what's the most desperate circumstances you've been in? In the end of May, the unit I was with, 36th Brigade of the 9th Division under General Mustafa and General Qasim, we were trying to get to the first bridge, the northernmost bridge. There's a big hospital there. They're taken over by the Chechens. They had about 200 ISIS there, strong pointing that. Sniper tower. Sniper tower, machine gun tower, anti-tank tower. While we're in place, we notice more and more civilians are getting killed. Not just one or two or three like we see every day. Dozens. Dozens. We saw a Humvee coming down the road like this with civilians piled on it, all shot. And there's people running, about 40 people at once, carrying wounded. Almost everybody shot in some way. So this is going on the whole day. And where are these people coming from? Finally, this guy came up. He was not wounded. And he was carrying a couple wounded. And he was crying. He says, the babies, the babies are killing the babies. Baby, 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 it's going to be alive, baby. So they just shot my two. They shot my two daughters. Oh, man, how can you comfort someone like that? So I just hugged him and asked him, what's happening? He said, ISIS is killing anybody who's trying to escape from the hospital area now. There's maybe 150 dead people. We ran through them. We drive up to the front where this is happening. I want to see what's going on. And as it gets dark, people start crawling across the road who've been shot and fake dead. So we get casualties. So all night long, we're up taking care of people who are wounded. The next morning, I get out to that street. And I look and I go, Oh, there's a dead person. It's another dead person. Oh, that's not a bundle of rags. That's a person. And then you realize there's a lot of dead people. But ISIS is controlling the street. And then there's a wall, and there's more dead bodies against the wall. And there's movement. There's maybe five kids or so still alive, little kids, against that wall. But as they move out, one by one, they get shot or disappear. And then there was one girl that never wanders around. And after about an hour, she's the only living kid. We've done four rescues by now already. And we've done a lot of running under fire. You know when that's like maybe possible. This is no way. 150 yards, anti-tank systems, anti-aircraft in ground mode, machine gun snipers. You cannot going to make it. So what are we going to do? So I pray, God, how are we going to do this? So I run back to the Iraqi army. I said, hey, you got two Abrams here. Give me an Abrams in the front, a bulldozer behind to clear the, the rubble. We'll drive up. The two Humvees will fan out, provide firepower. The tank will be blasting. The bulldozer opens away. My Humvee will evacuate people in it. That's the plan. And the general just says, no, we got our own battle going. Can't have the tanks. I feel really bad for you. I know it's horrible, but this is happening everywhere. And then I'm calling the Americans. Half the hospital and all the buildings they're shooting us from on the, on the southern side are still, they can still see us. And I said, you know, we need smoke. If you could drop smoke to, to screen us, we have a chance to using Iraqi armor to get in close enough. If they put that concentration down about, let's say, one in 200 yards, one in 100, they'll just obscure the whole thing. So the Americans say, you wouldn't give you smoke at this time. I need to get the tanks, though, but they're not available because they're fighting all the time. And then my phone rings. It's my chaplain, a guy named Paul Bradley from Thailand. He said, Dave, you're on my heart. I'm praying for you. How can I pray for you? I said, I got this girl, man. I can't save her. 
I need smoke and I need a tank. And I can't get through to her. And he goes, let's pray right now. And as he prayed, all my faith came up. And I, by the time we got done praying, I felt we're gonna do this because God's gonna help us. So then I went back to the Iraqi commander. I said, come here. I said, the smoke is coming now. He says, still no way. And I said, can we pray? And he goes, yes. Dear Lord Jesus, please show my commander the right way, your way, whatever that is. I said, what did Allah tell you? And he goes, okay, one tank. No bulldozer, no Humvees, one tank. Take it or leave it. I said, I take it. So we say the Lord's Prayer. And I said, whoever's going, follow me. We started running. The tank took off down the road and I'm running behind it and it's taking fire right away from ISIS, even though we got smoke coming from the Americans that make it difficult for ISIS to see. I felt like I was disengaged from a roller coaster and just like flying off the top on purpose. You had to make that commitment. Here we go. So I felt I was running. By the time we got down to where the little kid was against the retaining wall, bullets are pinging off the tank, going over us, hitting the ground next to us. We we're just trying to stay behind the tank. And I called the Americans again. I said, yeah, please, more smoke. Please coordinate with the Iraqis and give more smoke. So the Americans coordinate with the Iraqis, drop more smoke. It was beautiful, like screen in front of us. I remember I came to the edge of the tank, Sky and Ephraim are in the corner. And I said, this is what I'm gonna do. You guys give me cover, I'm gonna run. And I thought, there's no way I'm gonna live through this. I've been in many, many gunfights, especially in the Battle of Mosul. There's different intensities. And I just knew this one was gonna be terrible. I think I'm gonna die doing this. It wasn't fatalistic, it was just kind of logical. You're not gonna make it on this one. But damn, that kid's still there. I gotta do something. I just thought my wife and kids would understand if I die right now, they will understand. Because I could feel their heart in my heart. And I just felt it's now or never. And I prayed, Jesus help me. And I just took off at a run. Ran up to her, grabbed her by the arm. She was holding on to her dead mother. I had to pull her off her dead mother. Ice is shooting at us and I picked her up, ran back. I gave her to Mahmoud, hold on to her, and I prayed, said, well, thank you, Jesus, and bless this girl. Then turned around and saw there was two more people alive. I ran back, got Sky and Ephraim to help me. We carried the two back, we'd all been shot. The two men shot multiple times. We got back there behind the tank. Now we have to move back. And our original plan was we'd have Humvees. So we'd stick people in Humvees and drive back using the tank. We didn't have that. So now we gotta carry and drag the two men and the girl. I'm carrying the girl. And as we're running back, ISIS is just shooting at the tank. Bam, 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 bam. Ephraim, he shot through the calf, he goes down, gets up, almost gets crushed by the tank. In that whole confusion, one of the men is dropped. He falls outside the tank area. He's killed by ISIS. I still have a girl. And I thought, this actually happened. Thank you, God. I get to be part of life. I get to be part of hope. I can't believe it. I'm not dead. She's not dead. And as I was running, I told her, little girl, if no one ever takes you, if we can't ever find a living relative, don't worry, my wife and I will take care of you. You'll be our daughter. That's my promise. And then we got in the Humvee. My daughter jumped in the Humvee with me, and she drank six bottles of water on the weekend, drank for three days, and then got to her little casualty collection point. Her family all dead. Her whole family shot. Doctor put in an IV, gave her more fluids. Later that day, took her back to the, our command base, which is just some houses that Rocky Army had taken over, and General Mustafa came in. He looks at her and says, is this the girl I heard about that you saved? I said, yeah. He goes, thank you for loving my people. Then he picked her up and started to cry. He just felt her pain. I love General Mustafa for that. So we went back to Iraq in November. In the intervening time, General Mustafa found the grandmother. So I hadn't seen Demoa since just after the rescue. And I saw her and I just got on my knees. I just said, God, thank you. I can't believe I get to live to see this. And she smiled for the first time. And when General Grandmother came out, she surprised me by falling down on the ground and kissing my feet. And I quickly, it was embarrassing, I picked her up and she said, you didn't just save my granddaughter, you saved me. When I heard my daughter had died in Mosul, I thought I was died too. And then I realized I had a granddaughter. But if she was dead, I would be dead. You saved my life. So we took her inside and we start playing with Demoa, who before I'd never seen Demoa smile. Now she's smiling and we had balloons and toys and things for her. And as we were playing with her, the grandmother said, you know, I had a vision when I was in Deala, a man shining in white robes, with shining eyes, 
came to me. And then he went to Mosul. There was a wall and many dead bodies. And laying among the dead bodies was Demoa, my granddaughter. But there was a putrid evil stream separating her from life. And this shining white being stepped over that stream and picked up my granddaughter and carried her out. I said, oh, that was Jesus. He sent us to do that. He loves you. So I feel like we're connected to that family forever. That's the story of Demoa. And it's gonna be a long healing process, but she has a chance. Well, she wouldn't be alive today, but for you. No, she would not be alive. For, except for the Iraqi army, for the Americans, for the rest of our team, for people who prayed for us. No, no, but, but a person has to act in such a way that it makes a change in the outcome that was inevitable. And you did that. And you didn't have to. But what's going on inside you is not just, I'm gonna be a hero. No. You are a hero. <laughs> but, but the fact that you made that decision, you gotta have faith that you're gonna make it. Otherwise, all the natural tendencies of a human being is to say, I've gotta preserve my life here, but I'm, I'm willing to risk that to save this kid. So it's your decision that is ultimately the defining act of what turns out to be a six month long process of getting to see the kid go through the mall in Erbil. What you said about hero, I think we all wanna be heroes and we should, because that means you care about someone else. But when you're faced with life and death, whatever is a pride in that, that's gone because your self preservation instincts kick in and override all pride. Yes. So what motivates you to risk your life to save someone is not wanting to be a hero because right then you wanna be alive. Right. You want no part of this. So what enables you to do it, I believe is love and faith. God, you have me do this and he gave me love to, to do it. So whenever I'm afraid, I ask, well, am I supposed to do this, God? Make sure it's not pride, it's not comfort, it's not fear that's leading you. Then if I am, please give me love because I need that to do this. Conquers all. Yes, it does. If you ask David Eubank what he's accomplished, he'll tell you he's been a husband, a father, a U.S. Army Ranger, an officer in the U.S. Special Forces, a missionary, and a protector of the oppressed. But if you ask him what he is, he'll tell you he's an ambassador for Jesus. David will never claim to be a hero, but he is an American hero, and his story deserves to be told. Back in my time, they sing the song. And everybody sings along. The story of the infantry. Queen of battle, follow me. The mortars and artillery are crashing down around me. But deep in my heart, I have no fear. For I know my God is near. The life of a ranger is a life for me. For nothing in this world is free. For nothing in this world is free. 